Anyone with even a passing interest in the retro gaming scene would have noticed the plethora of new Sega Genesis and Mega Drive games recently. There seem to be more and more games in active development with every passing year, to the point that even those of us with a real interest in this have trouble keeping up with every new title. I'm sure this has led a lot of people to wonder, how are these games actually being made? And how does that process compare with how games were made back in the console's heyday back in the 90s? Well, that's precisely the question I want to try and answer in this video. For anybody new to the channel, let me introduce myself. My name is Pixie, and I have been studying Mega Drive game development as a hobby for almost a year now. I have two projects in development. One of them is a Mega Drive version of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and the other is a remake of the Game Gear Shinobi game. Being a developer myself, I'm naturally going to focus on the tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis, but if there are any other developers watching and they have a tool they find useful, then please feel free to leave a comment below. And of course, if there's anyone watching who actually made games during the 80s and 90s for the Mega Drive, then I would love to hear your story. Okay, now let's talk about how to make some Mega Drive games. Since a game is essentially a type of computer program, let's start with the coding. And if you're talking about programming any game in the 90s for the Mega Drive, you're pretty much looking at coding in assembly language. While assembly language might not be as complicated and complex as its reputation might suggest, there's no doubt that being able to use a higher level language definitely makes the job of the programmer a lot easier. Thankfully, nowadays we have a few options, the most popular being the SGDK, the Sega Genesis Development Kit, which allows us to code the Mega Drive games in C language. And not only that, but it also includes a number of built-in functions which allow us to do things such as parallax scrolling relatively simply. A rare and relatively famous example of C language being used back in the day to produce a game is Sonic Spinball. The relatively sluggish performance of that game at only 30 frames per second has led some people to believe that maybe C code doesn't compile very well onto the Mega Drive, but actually using the kind of modern compilers that SGDK uses, we get very good performance out of it. If C isn't your cup of tea, then you can also code a game using BASIC, just like the team who are creating the recently kickstarted RPG Affinity Sorrow are doing. Of course, there's always the option to go with the old-fashioned assembly language route, and if you're really hardcore like Matt Phillips when he created the Tanglewood game, you can even buy yourself an actual back-in-the-day development kit to make it on rather than a modern PC. Okay, since we now know how to write the code for the game, let's move on to the graphics. Fortunately, by the 90s, artists no longer had to draw their pixel art onto graph paper and then hand it to the programmer to put into the game. Sega actually had some what looked to be pretty decent software and tools available for artists to use to draw sprites and backgrounds. When creating graphics for the console these days, you can pretty much use whichever program you're comfortable with, so long as the file is saved in the right format and the actual image itself it adheres to the limitations of the hardware and of the color palette, then it should be fine to put into the game. For me personally, I like to use a program called Asprites because it's a drawing program made specifically for pixel art, so I think it's very suitable for making Mega Drive graphics with. So we've already covered two very important factors so far in creating a game, i.e. writing the code and creating the graphics. However, as everyone knows, a great game isn't truly great until we have some amazing music to go with it. In the early days of the console's life, if you wanted to create some music for it, you couldn't just be a musician alone, you also had to effectively be a programmer. Although for some super talented people such as Yuzo Koshiro this wasn't a problem, to make things easier for everyone, Sega of America created some music creation software for the Mega Drive, the most famous, or maybe I should say the most infamous of which, was GEMS. Of course, as the saying goes, a bad workman blames his tools, and 
It's the same with gems. You could create some good music and some music, some good music was created using gems, but it was also so easy just to grab some random, easy to get uh, instruments and just put them into the music, which is why some of the, especially the Western American Mega Drive Genesis games end up sounding quite samey. Fortunately, when making music today, we have other options. One of those is called the VGEM Music Maker. However, the probably the most common way of making Mega Drive music these days is using a program called Deflamask. Deflamask is actually pretty user friendly, even for a non-musician such as myself, but I've been lucky enough in my own projects to have lots of very talented musicians volunteer their services. One of those, Inglebard, who's been helping me with the Castlevania Symphony of the Night game, has created a, started to create a series of tutorials about Deflamask. So Rather than talk about it too much here, I will simply link to his video so anyone interested can get more information from there. Having already written some code for your game as well as added some graphics and music, chances are that you want to test it out. If you're looking at this rather strange contraption in this gentleman's hand and thinking to yourself, that looks a little bit like an ancient flash cart, well you're kind of right. While it might look a bit clunky by today's standards, I'm sure it's a lot better than having to keep burning EEPROMs or whatever they had to do before Sega invented this thing. These days of course we have these very nice looking, very compact, high capacity flash carts such as the Mega Everdrive. While it's always a good idea to test things out on real hardware from time to time, for day to day testing of new things in your game, modern day emulators are more than accurate enough to do the job. And what's more, many emulators, for example Blastem that you're seeing here, have some really great debug features too, so you can keep an eye on your VRAM and color palette and many other things. Just to show you how relatively easy it is to make changes and to test those changes within a modern development environment, take a look at this example where I'm going to swap Alucard Sprite for a different one. So first I'm going to delete Alucard Sprite from the ROM replace it with the new one, save and compile, open up the emulator and hey presto there we have it. I'm sure many of you recognize this young lady, she looks like she's having a bit of a bad hair day today judging by how much she's messing about with her hair, obviously we've still got the old Alucard animation code that will need to be changed but I hope it gives you a good idea of how quick and easy it is to make these small changes. If I had to use a single word to sum up the difference between developing Mega Drive games in the 80s and 90s compared with today, that one word would be tools. Especially in the first few years of the console's lifetime, developers really were dealing with a little black mysterious box. There was no operating system, there were very few tools, there was obviously no kind of game engine like Unity or Unreal Engine. Before even starting to create a game, they often had to first create the tools to make the game with. Any tools and equipment that were readily available were often very expensive, as you can see from this price list here. Keep in mind that these are all 90s prices, so once you take a, uh, some inflation into account, you can imagine how expensive they really were. Thankfully for those of us creating games these days, tools are widely available, they're very easy to use, and they're also either very cheap or completely free. We truly are standing on the shoulders of giants, whether it be those who created games back in the 80s and 90s, or all those who came afterwards in the homebrew community who created all these marvellous tools for us to use. A big thank you to all of them. For those of you with a casual interest in how games are made, I hope this video satisfied your curiosity. And for everyone else, maybe those of you who after watching this thinking, maybe I'd like to create my own games, well you're in luck, I'm about to start a tutorial series teaching you everything to do with Mega Drive and Genesis games development, from creating graphics to coding to doing parallax scrolling, how to code the controller, how to make music, sound effects, everything. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh but I've never made a game before, I haven't even written a line of code before. Don't worry, my tutorial series is going to be specifically designed for people like yourself, people who have, don't know how to code, who have never coded, never made a game. We're going to take things very slowly, step by step, and I will explain everything. 
So if that sounds interesting to you, please subscribe to the channel. Chances are that if you're watching this video two weeks after the upload, the tutorials have probably already started. Thank you for watching and I will see all you lovely people next time.